Hello and welcome to Yodo. I'm Dr. Sarah Bone. This is a place where we learn about serious illness and we talk about difficult topics in an open and an honest manner. Dr. Lisa Tartaglia, who helps me with the channel, and I want to present patients and families the knowledge that they deserve to make the healthcare decisions that they need that's going to help them achieve their goals of care. Today, we've got a review of a book, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer, by Siddhartha Mukherjee. This was published in 2010. The book was written from the author's perspective of a few cancer types, the significant investigators, physicians, and those being treated for the cancer. And this was prior to 2010 when he was in his training. This is about what he encountered, some of what he encountered, I should say, during his two-year oncology fellowship. The book has numerous accolades from many sources. However, it really wasn't my cup of tea. I was introduced to the book by a highly intelligent, compassionate, and inquisitive medical student that was with me for a month. He was well on his way for his lifelong journey of being a learner when he introduced this book to me. And as fortune would have it, a copy of the book presented itself to me one day when we were on our hospital rounds. I struggled while reading the book as I found in some ways the villain was not always the cancer that was attacking the patient. The bright young medical student with me pointed out that it's a biography of cancer not of the patients that had the cancer. And this gave me a much better perspective of the book. The author put tremendous effort into providing an accurate historical account of a few types of cancer and the pioneers that steered those treatments. The other characters that he introduced the reader to included those involved with the business of cancer, as well as a few patients. I hesitate to use the word victim, but I'm also reluctant to use the word survivor, as many of the patients of the times that he discussed in the book did not survive a significant amount of time from the time of their diagnosis of cancer. I also hesitate if the patient suffered more from the offending cancer or sometimes from the treatment. Some of the treatments he described were horrific. Physicians were using chemicals with unknown effects and unimaginable side effects. Surgeons resorted to more and more aggressive interventions with sometimes body mutilating results, and oftentimes it lacked the documentation required for evidence of reduction of the relapse rate or decrease in the death rate. For those accepting radiation treatments, they also ventured into the unknown and allowed themselves to be treated on without knowledge of outcomes or any idea of acceptable limits, duration, intensity, or realizing that the radiation being used to treat their cancer could in fact cause or result in other cancers. I'm going to read a quote from early in the book when he says, it was impossible not to be swallowed. I spent the end of evening rounds in stunned incoherence. The stories of my patients consumed me, and the decisions that I made haunted me. Was it worthwhile continuing yet another round of chemotherapy on a 66-year-old pharmacist with lung cancer who had failed all other drugs? Was it better to try a tested and potent combination of drugs on a 26-year-old woman with Hodgkin's disease and risk losing her fertility, or to choose a more experimental combination that might spare it. Should a Spanish-speaking mother of three with colon cancer be enrolled in a new clinical trial when she can barely read the formal and inscrutable language in the consent forms? There are so many concerns in that paragraph alone. Then he states, As I emerged from the strange desolation of those two fellowship years, the questions about the larger story of cancer emerged with urgency. How old is cancer? What are the roots of our battle against this disease? Or, as patients often ask me, where are we in the war on cancer? How did we get here? And can this war even be won? His questions focus on the academic and don't really address the questions of quality of life. Was the treatment worth it to the patient? And how? In what manner did the patient achieve their goal? What did the patient gain? Was their suffering reduced? Was their pain eliminated? Did their function and strength improve? Those were rhetorical questions of mine that aren't really answered in the book. To say the least, I admire the patients that were introduced in the book. To my mind, they're the true heroes. But as the medical student pointed out, this book is not about them. To me, the other characters of the book, the physicians and the cancer itself, intermittently change roles between villain and victim. We'll get back to that in a bit. The author defined the cancer as the limitless, unbridled, and distorted growth of cells as clonal deviation. Metastasis is Latin for beyond stillness, as the cancer cells migrate through the body to new locations. He addressed the causality of cancer is not civilization, 
But in the process of becoming civilized, we live longer and extend our lifespan, thus the risk for cancer increases. The author recounted a conversation with a patient when he informed her that her cancer was curable and the chances were about 30%, just less than one in three. And those are his words. He commented on the time of day, the city below the window, but he did not mention emotions, his emotions or the patient's. He stated that he informed her it was often curable. And I would ask you the question, is that curable? Is often curable less than one in three? Is 30% what you would consider as often curable? I appreciated the history that the author provided of cancer and the various warriors, the physicians, the researchers, the philanthropists that eagerly accepted the challenge and tirelessly plotted their next steps in the declared war on cancer. The book did not really have a resolution. As we all know, we have yet to conquer cancer. This book is just a small portion of the unending tale of the history of our conflict with cancer. We have learned over time that primary prevention, appropriate testing, and surveillance are all keys that help us unlock a significant element in the management of the cancer monster. The author hopped about on different timelines as well as through different cancers throughout his book, and I found the flashbacks and flash forwards in the various timelines difficult to follow. He didn't really explore either on a timeline or a particular malignancy consistently. In the same chapter or even on the same pages, he might discuss Egyptian times to the 1900s, to his days of training, and then back again to Egyptian times. The author gave a detailed history of a few major players in the war to defeat cancer from his perspective. He referred to these individuals throughout the book, building on the narrative and the role that each person played. Sidney Farber was born in 1903, a pathologist that became a pioneering oncologist. Working with childhood leukemia patients, he was using an antifolic acid agent a chemist friend of his was developing. The author referred back to the work of these two individuals and their work on the various leukemias throughout the book, at the very beginning as well as at the very end of this book. He described the mood of the cancer ward that Dr. Farber worked in as being terrible and that they provided all that they possibly could to provide total care to those patients. However, he stated, death stalked the wards relentlessly and pediatric deaths occurred routinely. Throughout the book, he wove admired words of impassioned work and dedication of Mary Woodard. Mary was a philanthropist born about 1900 and married Albert Lasker, nearly 20 years her senior, and he introduced her to the world of advertising and obtaining donations and accessing what he considered and called unlimited funds. She was driven by several significant memories that motivated her to push forward gathering finances and personnel to power the cancer war machine. And she was quoted as saying, I'm opposed to heart attacks and cancer the way one is opposed to sin. Just 12 years into their marriage, Albert was diagnosed with colon cancer and he survived only a year after that. Albert's death was a devastating blow for Mary Lasker and the person known by many as the fairy godmother of cancer research, crusading for a cure, was taken out of the limelight for a period of time. In the mid-1950s, she resumed to the society pages and resumed her role with a more relentless, urgent and insistent tone toward her work to finding a cure for cancer. The author gave accurate historical account of the Scottish surgeon Joseph Lister in the 1860s and his role identifying changes of a wound that indicated infection. This took me back to my own memory of learning this information during my training days. Upon reading one particular comment in the book, I actually made a startled noise that my family inquired about. In the neighboring town of Carlisle, Lister observed a sewage disposer cleanse their waste with a cheap, sweet-smelling liquid containing carbolic acid. Lister began applying carbolic acid paste to wounds after surgery. That he was applying a sewage cleanser to his patients appeared not to have struck him as even the slightest bit as unusual. The author delved into the world of radiation by discussing Wilhelm Rentgen and highlighting his work with vacuum tubes, electrons, and x-rays. He included Madame Curie, her husband Pierre, and their discovery and work with radioactive rich uranium. He connected Emil Grubb and his inspired notion of using x-rays to treat cancer, giving way to the new medical specialty of radiation oncology. Fairly, he discussed their successes, their failures, and their suffering because of their unprotected work with radiation. 
The author was honest in his horrific discussion of the damage done early in this field with indiscriminate irradiation by physicians that had little or no knowledge of the effects or side effects. An interesting side note was his discussion of the young ladies who were used to color the clock faces with radium containing paint. They would hand paint the faces, the hands and the numbers on the clock so that they would glow in the dark. But soon the ladies who were doing the work also glowed because of their work with the radiation from the uranium that they were painting and they suffered from radiation poisoning themselves. Also included in the book was William Halstead, a surgeon born in 1852 who suffered his first nervous breakdown during medical training as he split his time between school and surgical clinic responsibilities. And the author was quoted saying, a pattern of Olympian exertion, taking himself and others to the brink of physical impossibility. And that became his hallmark. He left a distinct mark on surgery and medical education in general as we know it today. He had high expectations and high demands. In the 1880s, his personal experimentation with cocaine and his attempt at addiction management with morphine, as well as his ongoing battle with the recurrent addiction relapses while he was trying to balance his medical practice and teaching of young medicine students. Per the author, his surgical students spiraled out of control to cut wider and deeper, taking the radical mastectomy to the extreme, removing the tumor, the breast, the chest muscles, the ribs, part of the sternum, the lymph nodes from the neck, as well as the axilla. Statistics of the surgery, however, did not bear out that that improves the quality of life or the cancer-free longevity beyond three years. In keeping with the author who referred to the flaw of mistaken kindness, which he discusses in the book, the surgeons diligently worked to banish attempts to lessen their aggressive strategy. They wanted to keep the surgery aggressive because they thought that that was going to help them find that cure. The book focused on human resilience, perseverance, and ingenuity. Physicians practiced in a paternalistic manner then, and there was little or no informed consent. The author pointed out how testing of a treatment preceded the consent for the medications, the surgery, or even the radiation. One can hope that some sort of discussion occurred and the patient or the surrogate was provided the opportunity to ask questions, have time to consider or accept and decline that offer for treatment. The Nuremberg Code for Human Experimentation Requiring Explicit Voluntary Consent from Patients was drafted in August of 1947. And just a month later, in September of that same year, a two-year-old was being injected with his first treatment for a new trial drug for his cancer treatment. The author doubted that the physicians and scientists had ever heard of the new ruling at the time of that treatment of that child. There's not even a remote chance of something like that occurring today. He reviewed many cancers, but considerable effort was placed in the discussion of leukemia, lymphomas, abdominal cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. On the topic of lung cancer, he provided some moving details of the appalling and hidden secrets of lung cancer. As we've all learned over time how much the tobacco industry knew of these dangers and the addictive nature of smoking, but it took considerable effort and many years to shed light into that dark corner of the room because of money and backroom campaigning. Society is not yet done reeling from the damage and increased cancers that have been caused by keeping that truthful information unpublished and keeping that data from reaching the mainstream. The cost of cancer treatment from lung cancer, care of the sick, change of the quality of life and function of those people and the resulting deaths is not yet fully known. Contemplation of the details of that heinous scandal is just mind-boggling. In summary, the author puts a tremendous amount of time into his research and providing information to the reader to educate them regarding the details of a few types of cancer and the people involved with treating those cancers. I found there were times that the villain of the book, cancer, was almost heroized. The book for me seemed either to intentionally avoid the discussion of the patient plight and suffering, or that information just was not visible to the author, or it was too detailed for him to provide in this book. I do recall one reference from the author regarding a patient's comments about her cancer progression and nearing end of life when she stated flatly, I am ready to return home for the death I was to have a few years ago. But there was no follow-up comment. She didn't say something like, I'm so glad for the time I've had, I feel like I've cheated death and now it's more on my terms, or day by day I've taken advantage of the time that knowing my time is going to be shorter. 
some sort of reassuring comment to the physician to let them know that they've been on the right track and they're grateful for the time that they've had. But no comments such as those were recorded in the book. The author gave an impassioned optimism with the discoveries of hormone receptors for breast cancer treatment and the chemotherapy that's now available for lymphoma and leukemia. Some patients have completely successful treatments, the type of success that all cancer patients are hopeful for. He spoke of breakthroughs in DNA testing and genes that may contain hidden risks for carriers for the secret messages that turn an unsuspecting cell into a cancer cell. With each step forward, we learn more about hidden information of the causes of cancer of each type of cancer. That leads us closer to exacting the proper treatment and the curative measures. So we get closer and closer. It becomes more and more within our grasp. I found the book informative, providing tremendous detail and look into the work that's been done by various individuals that were galvanized by the driving force behind the word cure. I also found it to be a heartbreaking tale that exposed misunderstanding, misadventures, and multiple failed attempts at treatment and cure. Much emphasis and focus was on the determination to conquer cancer. The book revealed the dedication and constant drive forward by so many to unravel the wicked web that cancer weaves in a person that can choke out life. The topics of finance were not approached with respect to cost to the patient, payment to the hospital or physician, cost of research. There was very little discussion about insurance and claim denials. The author provided a window into his thoughts as an oncologist, and this has given me new perspective. I appreciate your time today. If you have a question, drop it in the comment below and we'll get back to you. Bye now.